All right, well, my watch is showing that it is 2.30, so we're gonna get started because we only have an hour, and I know some of you have other things that you need to get to um, as well. So I wanna start out by thanking all of you for joining us. We have 100 people now, uh, just about a minute ago, we only had 65. So very um, thankful for the participation and for your willingness to spend the afternoon, or at least part of the afternoon with us. Um, I'm joined by my co-hosts here, um, Mark and Candy, and they are both on the call as well. I'm gonna turn it over to them after we have a little bit of an introduction and um, look at the results from the faculty survey for any updates they want to give to you. So essentially the format is very casual. We're just gonna go through um, an introduction briefly and then a few of, like I said, the survey slides and then we'll turn it over to you all after Mark and Candy provide some updates. Darren, do you want to advance the slide? I think he's on. Great, thank you. So I just wanted to start out by thanking you all for an amazing job. I mean, just unbelievable amount of work that's gone into transitioning to our distance format. I know that that has been a heavy lift, that it is it has not been an easy thing to do, and that it, we've had all kinds of challenges along the way in um, getting to where we are today, but it has really been an impressive accomplishment. And I think if anybody had told us we were going to do this a year ago, we would have thought there is all these reasons why that cannot happen. And yet um, you all have overcome those in just impressive and remarkable ways. So I, I want to thank you for that. I also want to say that we are in a very unprecedented, unprecedented time. This is not, as you all know, in any way normal. And so all the things that we are experiencing are uh, highlighted by the fact that we are not in a situation where we can ask our uh, peers or mentors about how to handle it. This is a, you know, once in a 100 year episode from a historical perspective, and we just don't have those models or those mentors available to us. We can't ask how it was in the Spanish flu for people who survived this, the flu in 1918. The world was obviously a very different place then as well. We can't ask our um, grandparents about how they survived those years prior to World War II or during World War II when they were rationing and they were, you know, some of them are still living, but they might not um, have the, the, um, you know, the people our age certainly um, don't have that um, memory. Uh, people who are, who were living through that during the World War II period are of course now, um, many of them gone. So we are in uncharted territory here. And we are doing this without the advantage of having that support from peers and mentors who have experienced it before. So if you are experiencing a lot of anxiety or fear, um, history tells us that that is normal during periods like this. So I just wanna send the message that it, if that, it, not to beat yourself up about that. Um, this is a difficult thing. Um, there are, very little precedence for what we are all experiencing as a community. And so if you're feeling anxious or fearful or emotional in ways you don't understand, that is actually a, a normal experience. So with that, I again wanna thank you for joining us and um, run through some survey results from the faculty survey that we sent out about a week ago. And it will give you a sense of where your colleagues are and how they are feeling. We asked a number of questions about, you know, how are you feeling as a faculty member on these various elements? And I'll just give you the sort of the, the high level data here and reiterate that this is preliminary. We still have some results coming in. So this was as of April 20. We had 192 faculty who had completed the survey at that time. So how satisfied are you on a scale of one to five? 
um, one, not being satisfied at all with the engagement of your students in the new teaching environment. And that is not a surprising result. There is quite a bit of concern in the faculty about student engagement. Um, we knew that anecdotally. And we are working with student affairs to figure out ways to reach out to those students who you have reported to us have gone dark or that you're concerned about. And um, figuring out different ways to, to communicate with those students um, working with student affairs. But you can see here that there is a significant amount of concern about that issue. Next slide. So on a scale of one to five, how concerned are you about student success in your courses? Now, this is something that you all are concerned about on a regular basis, we know, um, but it may be more pronounced in this time period with this rather abrupt or very abrupt transition to a distance environment for most of our sections. There's a lot of concern about how students are tracking in terms of that transition. Um, we are aware that there are concerns about that um, on the student side as well. And certainly we see that here um, on the faculty uh, survey results as well, but more mixed, uh, more mixed than the previous slide. We asked about department budget issues. You know, how concerned are you about the budget? Um, in part because we want to make sure that we're responsive to those concerns, but also just wanting to understand um, what the concerns of are of faculty right now. Um, clearly, this is a big one. 64% uh, reporting significant concern on this issue. So well over half. This is the the most um, consistent of the answers to to any of the questions. And then technological challenges in the distance environment. This is um, pretty much a mix. Uh, we were expecting it to, to be um, more concern than we see in this survey result, although there's still quite a bit. 56% um, either um, marking a three or a four on the concern level here. Um, only 8% um, reporting significant concerns, and then 15 and 21% um, respectively at one and two. And then on a scale of one to five, how concerned are you about maintaining a research or service portfolio? Quite a bit of concern about this, um, a 22%, uh, more than 20% saying that they are very concerned about this. Um, but almost 25% saying that they're not concerned at all. Uh, we've got more variance in this one than any of the other questions, and that really is a testament to the different types of programs we have on campus and the different experiences our faculty are having in this environment. Uh, some of our um, programs actually have more research and more service opportunities than they can even manage right now, and some are really feeling um, the impact of having to move to a distance environment. So this is a big mix. In terms of faculty responses that were positive, I wanted you to be able to see what the types of positive reactions faculty are having. Uh, these are faculty members who reported positive comments and where they fell in here. 37% uh, um, cited the transition to online. So why there is a lot of concern about it, um, there were some positives in the mix as well. Um, ITRC received really big, um, big kudos from almost everyone. Lots of comments about how great the ITRC res response has been, and I've shared that with Blake. ITRC reports to the provost's office, so we are making sure that Blake is supported and that his budgets will not be negatively impacted in, in this process or working very hard to prevent that um, negative impact potential. And then others, you know, we got, they said they were doing okay, that um, they were doing okay, and then positives on um, college leadership as well. And then um, a pretty wide array of concerns here, not surprising given the really challenging environment that we're in. Um, number one, 16% cited online um, teaching technology challenges. Now these are in the comments, as I mentioned. So while there was a mix in the question, there is still quite a bit of concern showing up in the um, comments. And then 12% um, being concerned about budget. 
uh, not too surprising. 16 and 12 are the highest here, but then and then 12% for education quality. And then from there, it's just a wide mix of things that include student communication, inability to get into this into those um, hands-on labs, um, promotion of tenure, and so forth. So in relationship to promotion and tenure, I wanted to just remind you all that there is a link to this on our website. I've provided it here. This is the Academic Affairs COVID website. That's where we're keeping track of all of the communications and um, changes uh, related to our response, including grading, for example. The provost office will, will um, utilize our stop the clock process um, for COVID related problems for TMP and this just means that faculty members who are experiencing a um, significant break in their ability to complete their projects uh, during their tenure or promotion review period can ask for an extension for up to two years through the stop the clock process. Stop the clock is something we already had and so it's in place this is a request that goes to the dean and then goes to the provost office. We don't ask questions about these. Um, if they um, make sense, if there is a legitimate um, impact to the faculty member, they get approved. In the past, those have been usually um, childcare related or the death of a parent, perhaps, or the loss of income for a short time. Um, and so we folded COVID um, responses into that mix. And then a lot of you have asked about teaching evaluations and how we will manage those in this environment that we're in now. I've sent out a special statement about this um, to the deans and chairs, and it's available at this link. But bottom line, it, it essentially, the provost office will be evaluating um, teaching evaluations from this period of time um, with an eye to what we're experiencing here. Comments about technology, comments about challenges um, with maintaining the syllabus, for example. Um, normally, we don't change the syllabi in the middle of the term, but we have a lot of that happening out of necessity um, in this time period. Those things will simply be disregarded in the process of evaluating teaching evaluations for the spring term. And just as a reminder too, most of the time when we're analyzing teaching evaluations at the provost level, we're doing it in either a three or a five year um, review period. So we're looking at evals over a five year period for promotion or tenure, for example. And hopefully this will be just one term anomaly in that five year period and we can disregard it. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark and Candy for any updates that they might have. And Candy, you can go first if you'd like. All right. Well, I first want to say hello and it's wonderful to see you even if you're just thumbnails. It's wonderful. It's it's been a while. Um, I also wanted to say and echo what the provost said that I am incredibly grateful to all of you for the ways in which you have managed these really difficult times. Um, I was talking to Elise in the college office right before we all kind of went our separate ways. And I said, five years ago, we could not, we could not have done this. And so what you've done has been really remarkable. Um, and I'm grateful to ITRC, um, IT, um, but most importantly to all of you who've had to migrate a lot of curriculum, um, adjust the ways that you are most comfortable teaching, um, and, and really, um, I, re I received emails almost every day from students thanking me for the ways in which you all have taken care of them. So um, thank you, I'm, I'm very appreciative. I also wanted to take a moment, I think it's, um, the, the coincidence is not lost on me, um, but today is Administrative Professionals Day. And I know we have a number of those folks on the call or on the Zoom meeting with us. And so I want to say a special shout out, a special thank you to all of our administrative assistants, to our financial tax, to our office assistants, all the people that are keeping us going um, and who are often trying to operate in, and run our offices 
remotely um, as well. So I, I'm very grateful for all of them. Um, as we kind of look towards what we have left to accomplish um, this spring semester, usually we're, we're pretty busy preparing for graduation, um, final recitals, those things we don't have right now. Um, but there have been some really creative solutions that many of you have utilized. So I would encourage you, if you get a moment, take a break, um, jump on to the website for the Department of Art. Um, they actually have up their 2020 annual undergraduate art exhibit and scholarship competition. Um, and some incredible work done by our students um, under really the tutelage of, of our faculty. So that might be a wonderful way to, to celebrate a segment of our our um, academic community. And then just two more really quick things. Um, we've been trying to stay connected with students by using social media. Um, and Madison Shumway in our college has done a great job of doing that. Um, so if you have, you have something fun, if you have a way, an idea about how we might be able to connect, ways that we can celebrate students' accomplishments or faculty accomplishments, um, staff accomplishments, we would love to be able to continue to do that as a way to connect. So, please reach out to Madison if you have information. Um, and then finally, I am worried about our students right now. I'm worried about um, their mental health. I worry about that because we really are and have been. Um, in our college, we've talked a lot about this kind of in that suicide belt. Um, and I don't want them to feel disconnected from us right now. So if you have a student who's in crisis and you don't know how to help, know that um, counseling and testing is still available, and they can work with students using telehealth um, tools. So um, they're there to help. But thank you for what you're doing. This is really odd, complex. Never thought we'd have a faculty meeting this way. Um, but thank you for attending. I think the last time I checked, we were up to 125 people across the two colleges. So way to go. Mark. Thanks, Candy. And I will reiterate what both you and Laura said in terms of my level of impressions of the work that the faculty has done, faculty and staff, um, it is really remarkable and it's heartwarming. It's really um, lifts my spirits to see everything that we've accomplished in such a short period of time. Um, I don't think we really realize what we were capable of until we, we faced this unprecedented experience. Also want to give a shout out to all the admins and other support personnel for Administrator Professional Day today. Uh, what you do, you are really the engine that drives us. Uh, we couldn't get a lot of the work done if it wasn't for you coordinating that and helping us. So again, thank you so much for all that you do for us. Um, just a couple things. I know I've, I've tried to communicate with faculty in the College of Ed on a fairly regular basis, but if you feel like you're not being communicated with enough, please reach out to me. Um, if I'm not stuck in a Zoom meeting, I'm on email talking to all of you. So um, I'm happy to get back to you as quickly as I can. Um, one of the things that we've really been focusing on uh, all year long is our student retention. And we're coming up to a really critical time, so I want to remind all of our faculty, you are our linchpins in student retention. You have the best connection with our students. Uh, one of the things that you'll learn about as we um, <clears throat> kind of move through this COVID experience, uh, the feds are going to um, allocate some funding to, to higher ed, and a lot of that is going to get passed through to our students. Um, <clears throat> and there will be some pieces that will be um, of value to them if they enroll in summer courses and again in fall courses. So especially those students that are currently enrolled in classes, uh, encourage all the faculty to get in touch with those students, keep them connected to you, to the programs they're a part of, to the college and to the university. We need every one of those students every semester. So, I mean, we did a little calculation that every student is like $8,000. So it matters, it really matters, especially since budget is such a huge concern. And I'm sure there'll be budget questions that'll come up and we're not gonna get into any, I won't provide any details on that right now, um, unless there are specific questions. But I will tell you the last two days, we've all been engaged in very serious budget discussions. And from my perspective, and I think Candy and others who were part of that call will, will support this, I was incredibly impressed with the quality of work that all the leaders across campus have done to take on our budget challenge as a collective. We're united in trying to keep this campus functioning at the highest level possible with the minimum of disruption to students, to faculty, to services. Um, it's not an easy task, but boy, people have really been stepping up and, and you should know that about your leadership. So uh, beyond that, there's a hundred things we can talk about, but I think it would be best for us to hear from faculty and staff about their concerns. 
So Laurel, kick it back to you. Or to whoever's moderating. I don't know if Stuart's moderating or... Uh, actually, we have Ginny, who's going to help us with questions, and I'm going to turn it over to her um, in just a moment. Um, I, uh, uh, like Mark and Candy, um, just want to shout out to my um, administrative assistant, who is on our call. Um, Callie has been um, very heroic in managing the provost office in a remote environment. So thanks, Callie, for all of your hard work. Um, this is not the way we thought we were going to be doing the spring term, clearly. None of us. Um, I also want to thank Ginny. Um, Lara Moore, who's on our call, she's going to be moderating our questions for us. Uh, Marketing and Communications has helped us set up this um, town hall and um, has provided uh, the support for moderation as well. So go ahead, Ginny, and we will find out how the questions will work. Great, thanks, Laura. Okay, so everybody who is on the call today, you can just, if you haven't used the chat feature before, what you do is you kind of hover over the video and you can see some icons pop up at the bottom. Click on the, the icon that says chat and then uh, the chat feature will open up to the right. Now to take questions because there are so many of us, um, we will do questions um, just to me. So I'm going to include some instructions in chat right now. So you should get a notification that you received a chat. Um, so to send a question just to me, what you'll do is you'll go to the blue drop down menu and you'll select my name, Jenny Laramore. Um, it is alphabetical or you can click on my name um, above where I've sent this message out. Um, and then you'll know that you've um, done it so that we can speak anonymously because my name will be written and then the red in parentheses will say privately. So if you do that and type to me, um, then only I will see it and I will ask each question anonymously. Um, and then I also wanted to note that this is being recorded and will be added to the town hall um, website, which is isu.edu slash town hall. And if anybody um, in your area was not able to come today, they will be able to get an updated link there. Um, uh, usually takes about three hours from, um, from this time to get that up on the website. Um, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jenny. And um, before we do that, I, I need to uh, make an introduction. Uh, we have our new Dean of the College of Education joining us on the Zoom call as well. Uh, many of you have met her. Some of you have not had of that privilege. If you're not in the College of Ed, um, Dr. McGivney Burrell is joining us. And Jean, I, you may want to just say hello. No. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, very nice to uh, be with you all today. Uh, I'd prefer to be in Pocatello with you, but um, I'm glad that I can visit with you remotely um, and very much looking forward to beginning my work um, come July 1st. So thanks for letting me listen in, um, and um, I'm excited to hear what people have to say. Thank you. And with that, Jenny, we'll start with the questions. I know that you said you had some um, submitted questions in advance. So however you want to manage that. Great. Thanks. I will start with the submitted ones, and then I will take the ones that were just chatted, um, and then the ones after that. So the first question is, in order to avoid hardships for students who might need certain classes for their program of study and who might need to delay registering for fall classes because of the current, because of the current situation, could the fall schedule remain unchanged until August? Well, I, I'm really glad that question was asked um, because, as you know, and some of you, we've been um, kind of grappling with the, the fall schedule in general and trying to figure out what is the best way to manage this going forward. So right now we have it locked um, for further changes but just because we don't have enough information um, to make changes to it at this time. We are expecting to hear um, additional information from health professionals and from our health team. We have a, a group of faculty and um, health professionals that are working on a plan, a back to work plan, um, but they really don't have the guideposts that they need right now since we don't have guidance from the governor's office on what will happen after the stay at home order expires or, or even when that will be. So they are planning, but um, Right now, it, it's a little uncertain. We anticipate face-to-face -face in the fall. 
for the majority of our courses that were planned to be face-to-face. -face. I mean, that doesn't mean that if you were planning to be online, you need to be face-to-face, -face, but um, planning to be face-to-face -face for the majority of our courses, expecting that some of our larger sections might have to be um, altered to fit the new guidelines. So that's where we are right now. I'm gonna leave the schedule closed for a bit while we get additional information and then um, I talked to Kevin about this. He's perfectly comfortable with, with sitting on some of these sections that look like they're just not populating right now. That's because our students are registering late in, in many cases. We expect to see late registrations um, due to the COVID um, epidemic, but other problems as well. And um, we are going to just be okay with that. So I just wanna send the message that if you are worried about the number of students in the course, we're not gonna worry about that for a while. So I just wanna send that message. Um, we're not gonna be looking at this course schedule in the provost office and saying, if you have under 10 students, we're gonna eliminate that section. Uh, this is too preliminary uh, for us to do that right now. And then our budget process, as, as has been mentioned, is, is in process. We expect that to wrap up by May, early May, first week of May. And um, really until that happens, we don't, we don't know even the outcome of some of the cuts that have been put forward by departments that included adjunct funding, for example. So we will have more information um, in a couple of weeks. And at that time, we will open the fall schedule to changes. But I didn't want just constant changing um, in that fall schedule until we knew a little bit more information. Great, next question. How soon will contingent faculty who are scheduled to teach in the fall be notified if they have a contract? So that's really um, you know, a, a more local question um, in terms of notification and even you know, what those individual circumstances are. I can say at the, and Mark and Candy may want to weigh in on this, but at the provost level, we um, have seen the budget proposals come through this week and, and there is a wide variance in how colleges and departments are, are addressing the budget challenges, in part because all of the colleges and programs have different, um, different levers they can push and different um, challenges they're trying to meet. So it's a mix across campus. We're not seeing um, any like real uh, consistency in terms of a call, all of the colleges saying, this is how we're gonna handle um, contingent faculty, for example. And we have, like I said, a variance across campus. In, if, in fact, those um, proposals that have come forward that involve contingent faculty or adjunct funding um, do ultimately become part of the budget going forward, and then um, certainly it's my um, strong uh, recommendation that we notify as soon as possible but it is preliminary now. I mean, those um, proposals that have come from departments and colleges are just now um, going to leadership council. Leadership council will evaluate these going forward and then admin council will do that same type of evaluation. So we're a ways away from knowing the outcome of those proposals. Candy and Mark, do you wanna contribute anything more to that? Am I frozen? There we go. I just want to say that it is true. Like Laura made a couple of really great points that I want to just reiterate. Um, the proposals are really varied. And one of the things that, and today was the first time we really got to see the landscape. And just to give you a sense, I, everybody really did, uh, as Mark said, kind of step up and try to come up with a combination of things. I think we all recognize that it is the faculty and our ability to deliver curriculum, um, you know, that's what we do at an institution of higher ed. And so I, I think everybody is very aware of that. Um, and I think we're all trying to find ways and, and utilize vacancies and, and things along those lines before we would really get to the point where we would talk about, you know, making those kinds of really permanent changes. So I, I appreciate everybody's um, patience with this process. Um, much like all of you going online quickly, we all had our budgets done. <laughs> and then, you know, the governor came back and said, 
you know, you, you need to plan for a 5% holdback. And so we very quickly uh, have been trying to put those proposals together and trying to figure out collectively what's in the best interest of the institution. So um, I'm, I'm really proud of my colleagues. It's been really wonderful to be a part of that leadership team. Yeah, and, and we're much the same in the College of Education. Um, we need to see what's going to happen with the final budget pieces, but we think we're going to be in pretty good shape um, to meet all of the obligations and requirements we have for our students um, and how that's going to pan out in terms of adjunct hires and those kinds of things is preliminary at this point. But um, I can say we feel pretty good about where we are and uh, well, typically we haven't made those decisions until a little bit later in the summer. Um, so we still have some time before we're really pressed to, to make that decision. But I do appreciate all the anxiety that folks are feeling. Uh, it's a very unsettled time. Um, and I know that a lot of people are anxious and nervous about what's going to happen and how it's going to impact you and your role. Um, just realize that we're all trying to maintain the best interest of our students and our faculty. And I know that in, in our college, one of our primary pieces is we didn't want to see anybody lose a job. We want to try and keep everyone employed. So we worked really hard to try and accomplish that. And then that, to that end, it required some cuts in other areas, but um, those are decisions that the leadership team in the College of Education made. Um, and we'll see how those all pan out as we work through this process. I'm sort of related to that. Some of you lived through an era when we notified campus-wide, like all second year faculty or all third year faculty or all um, certain uh, types of you know non-classified staff and there is no intention of doing that in this case we're not talking about those kinds of blanket notifications at all as as one of the levers that we're utilizing um, in the mix here and, and that just hasn't even been uh it's not even on the table as a conversation and it doesn't mean that we won't have personnel impacts from the decisions that are being made um, in the programs and in the colleges and, and up to the admin council. But that kind of blanket notification where every third year faculty member receives um, notification that says your position may or may not be available next year, uh, we're not anticipating doing that. So I, I, I want to make sure that, that we're clear about that. Okay. Next question. Is ISU planning a marketing campaign aimed at students who might need to retrain because of the projected economic downturn? And I, I can certainly take that one, Laura, if you'd like. That would be great. Thanks, Jenny. So um, the Office of Marketing Communications uh, has the same you know, budget situation as everybody else. So we're working through um, what we can hang on to and, and what we can't. Um, phase three of our statewide marketing campaign was uh, already planning to be very targeted. Um, we're planning to target and are already targeting high school age students. Um, so I imagine there will still be a good bit of that with um, adjusted language, depending on how things shake out um, at the time that the content's going out. But um, I can also say that um, Kevin has given our office a charter for storytelling, and we're working hard on that effort and storytelling and direct targeting will absolutely be part of it and considering uh, the economic downturn i imagine there will be um, some factors that play into getting that message across if needed you know i would just add as a corollary to that i think there will be opportunities for our programs to capitalize on as we emerge from this particular situation especially especially since uh, we've all gone online and almost all of K-12 has gone online. Uh, there's opportunities for us, especially in the College of Education, and in cooperation with our colleagues in Arts and Letters to uh, take advantage of some of the things that we've done and that we could do going forward. So I think we need to be starting to think about those opportunities and how we could uh, leverage our, the resources we have to make those happen. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, our online teaching endorsement or our instructional design and technology a faculty that could support th that kind of work that K-12 teachers are gonna need. I think there'll be a good share of high school K-12 students. Um, actually, I think more six, seven, eighth graders that will be wanting to stay home and not go to go to school that, that we may start to look at. And I don't think IDLA can meet all those needs. So and I think, I think one of the opportunities for us. Yeah, and, and I know that today when we were having the budget presentations, we talked a lot about this and, and how we also have a lot of adult learners um, who right now are displaced in terms of work. And so they may be looking to come back 
um, and finish that degree that they started, um, or they may actually, you know, decide that they need to retrain. And so I think there's lots of opportunities for lots of different programs that will meet uh, various needs. Great, thank you. And I, I absolutely agree with both Candy and Mark's uh, follow-up statements. So these are budget ideas that were submitted. Um, these, these are not questions, but I would like to just submit these um, budget ideas. Um, the first is reduce admin positions slash wages. Uh, next is eliminate admin bonuses if these exist. Uh, the next is sell unused, underused, ISU-owned off-campus properties. Um, next is reevaluate ISU athletic spending, especially conference-related sports like football, basketball. And the last is remove obligations of TT faculty, uh, tenure track faculty to travel, online conferences via Zoom, et cetera, would reduce, re reduce slash replace travel funding. So I know that um, Glenn, our uh, Vice President for Finance has joined us now. So he may want to jump in on some of that. Um, we did have a process campus-wide where um, those budget ideas were submitted and all of the ones that were just listed are in some way or another represented in that list. I think there were more than 200 of those. 300. Um, how many, Glenn? Oh, 300. 300. And so um, we've been going through those as uh, on the leadership council. I know that um, Glenn is has some additional information about where we are with those processes, so I'll let him um, continue that answer. Okay, thank you, Laura. And then I'll come back to you with, uh, I think there was a PNT question at the end, it sounded like. Um, the process, uh, we've looked at all 300 plus of those. Uh, they've been categorized uh, into different uh, major themes. Some of those uh, themes, uh, let's, let's just say cell phones, for instance. Uh, that was uh, assigned uh, to me and my team, and we're looking at uh, how much we're spending on cell phones, internet uh, reimbursements, et cetera, uh, to come up with a new policy um, uh, regarding that, because we really have not had a policy on cell phone usage um, or reimbursement uh, at this university. Uh, but we've assigned each of the major categories uh, to different people on admin council as leads or on leadership council. In addition, each of the deans, uh, when they came up with their budgets, started to look at some of these opportunities uh, to reduce uh, expenditures. But I don't want to skirt each of those by just talking process and, uh, and not addressing specific concerns. So Ginny, could you go back and just tell me the first one and I'll answer it and I'll just walk through those real quick because I think I have a quick answer for each one. You bet. The first one is reduce admin position slash, slash wages. Okay, so it sounds like there's two there. One is reduce admin positions, and the second is to reduce admin wages. Uh, admin positions are being reduced. Um, I can tell you that as we started through the, the uh, budget process with Leadership Council today, uh, a number of my colleagues have uh, started reorganization plans, uh, have uh, eliminated some positions. Um, I think the KDHS reorganization is probably the first kind of larger one that has had a little bit of press around it. Um, that, that Rex has, uh, we've essentially, I think, eliminated two dean positions. Is that right, Laura? And then I think some other administrative uh, positions. Um, in my area, um, I'm reorganizing, not doing a national search for a position. I'm going to promote somebody internally and uh, for the controller and uh, it'll be one of the deputy controllers and that will eliminate the deputy controller position. I'm actually going down two of those directors. So just in my area alone, the senior leadership part of my team, uh, I've eliminated a VP and two director level positions. My colleagues are doing the same thing. So it's not, this is not a, just one piece of the university is solving the problem. It's touching all areas of the university. Uh, admin wages, uh, there's been no talk about wages, wage reductions for any class of employee uh, at the university, whether it's admins or uh, uh, other non-classified or, or faculty. 
That's not to say there couldn't be. But. Eliminate uh, admin bonuses if these exist. Um, I'd like to know what the bonus plan is, and I think Candy would probably like to know, and, and Mark and Laura, so that we could partake in that, and Gene coming in new. But I've only been here a year, and you know Brian Hickenlooper's on here. Brian didn't share anything with me that there was an admin bonus plan. So, no, we don't have an admin bonus plan. The next is sell unused, underused, ISU, ISU owned off-campus properties. That is a great idea. And uh, for the, the, the people who were at the meeting uh, today at Leadership Council, they heard me char cal uh, characterize that and I shared a couple of things we've already started to do. And I'll go ahead and share that with you. Um, we have a building in Boise uh, that we have a lease on. And that housed our uh, lobbyists or our director of legislative uh, affairs. It served as a, a satellite office, if you will, if people were traveling over to Boise. It, it didn't make sense for us to have that and to continue that lease. Uh, I was able to successfully get us out of that lease uh, effective at the end of this month. It's only going to be saving us 24000 but it's $24,000 that we can invest in other areas. Um, we're also talking about mothballing one of the buildings on campus. And then as the other thing that, that I think is important, and for those of you who are PIs probably realize this, the more underutilized space we have negatively impacts our F&A rate when we do our proposal. And so I've already tasked, before all this started, I tasked facilities with looking across campus to identify spaces uh, that we don't need or that we could mothball so they don't go into the calculation of our indirect cost return. Our, our F&A rate is significantly lower than what it should be. And that one of the primary drivers is that space. So yes, we are looking at, at space. So thank you for that suggestion. Next one, Ginny. Reevaluate ISU athletics spending, especially conference related sports like football, basketball. I can assure you that uh, Pauline, our athletic director, is has been going over her budget with a fine tooth comb. Uh, in her presentation today, um, she shared a lot of information with us. Uh, she's trying to limit costs where they can. Uh, there was also discussion about the importance of athletics as one area, not the important area, but that's one part of a university that does attract students and adds to the life of campus and life around our community. So while there hasn't been discussions of eliminate athletics or limit athletics, she's operating under a budget just like I'm asking the, the deans and the president is asking Laura and I to do. And last suggestion, remove obligations of tenure track faculty to travel, online conferences to via Zoom, et cetera, would reduce replace travel funding. I'll take this, Glenn. Thank you. Uh, certainly, we are uh, looking at all kinds of options for managing travel going forward. One of those is going to be, to the extent that we can handle it in a virtual environment, that's what we should do in the short term. Um, in short term, meaning anywhere from three to Six, you know, six months to a year. Um, I know some of you have had questions about, you know, what does the fall term look like? How are we going to handle um, things like travel? I mean, travel is still uh, right now. There's still a um, campus um, sponsored travel ban, but we anticipate that will be lifted gradually as we go forward. And we have a back to work plan that will likely happen in phases. And in that phasing, there will be opportunities for um, different approaches to manage the travel in, in ways that um, we in the past have not utilized. So I anticipate we're, we're cutting travel in my office. Um, so we will not be going to as many board related, I mean, in person, as many board related meetings. There have been traditionally been three a month or so. And uh, we just, it just doesn't make sense. If we can do that virtually, that's what we need to do. And the same is true for conferences. And we'll certainly work with faculty to, to help you figure out what the best approach is um, in terms of your own disciplines. But 
I, I foresee a lot more virtual conferences. And, and I know that the big um, conference players um, right now, we're all assuming that they better have a virtual plan, even for their conferences for next year. And then related to the budget, um, just to, you know, the provost office, I don't, I don't want to get into the details here from a personnel perspective, but um, I can talk about Selena Grace's um, vice provost line. Uh, we are eliminating that. Uh, we did not fill it. Um, and then um, those duties have been absorbed. Um, there will be some impact, certainly, that will be felt as a result of that. Um, but we also eliminated three other positions in the provost office, and those will be uh, felt in various ways as well. It means that the, the load being carried by the existing staff in the provost office will be um, significant, and um, we will manage that. But I just wanted you know, to reassure you that all of the, all of the academic as well as non-academic units have looked at all the different ways we can meet these budget challenges. Great, next question. I had heard, or I heard a rumor from one of my students that ISU would be exclusively online in the fall. Is there any news on that? What should I tell my student? Jenny, can you repeat that for me? I, my internet was unstable for a second, so I'm gonna turn off my video. Absolutely. I heard a rumor from one of my students that ISU would be exclusively online in the fall. Is there any news on that? What should I tell my student? Okay, so essentially related to what we've already been talking about. Right now, we're planning on being face-to-face -face in the fall. That is our current plan. But we also have a medical uh, planning team uh, looking at the data that's coming out of the health district, also out of the governor's office, and um, formulating a three-month, six-month um, type of plan uh, for how we will all go back to back to work so our course scheduling in the fall will match that planning uh, meaning that if it's okay to be in groups of under 50 in the fall let's say then the courses that have more than 50 we will have to make sure have virtual options so that's how we are anticipating that planning to go we are not going to be we, we are not planning on being a 100 percent virtual institution um, in the fall and if that, you know I, it, there there could be something that changes that um, let's hope that does not happen okay um there's a question about the likelihood of going online and i don't know if you can answer that but another follow-up question um is can you address concerns about opening up too quickly um, I had Rex um, scheduled to, to talk to all of you, and I was hoping that we would be able to get an update from the health team, but he had to go to another meeting, and so is not here. But I can tell you that the number one planning goal of that group is health and wellness of our campus community, of our students, of our faculty. So that's the number one goal that we have in mind. You know, the number two goal is, of course, we've got to meet the needs of our students and our programs, but we're going to do that um, consistent with what the health recommendations are and what is safe for our campus and for our communities based on our own data in Idaho and in um, our communities. And so if we're still having significant community spread, but all of our um, all of our sister states are open, then we would have a different plan presumably, uh, than, they, than they might have. So these, these are um, decisions that will be made going forward, but I can tell you that um, we are not going to make decisions that put the health and wellness of the campus at risk. Great, next question. Yesterday, Boise State announced furloughs. Is there any discussion of a similar response happening at ISU in the near future? If so, how will nine month faculty be affected? Um, Glenn, do you want to take that? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, each of the universities in our state have a unique financial situation, and, and uh, we're all responding differently to this. Um, while our sister institutions have all had either discussions or unveiled some type of furlough plan, we have we don't 
currently have a furlough plan. That doesn't mean we will not have furloughs. Certainly in order to, to meet the, the uh, uh, fiscal impact of the, of the pandemic, we will need to look at furloughs as a, one part of a multi-part strategy to balance our budget. But I can tell you at this point in time, we do not have a furlough plan. Uh, the president has indicated that <clears throat> we will be discussing uh, different options for furlough plans uh, at admin council uh, relatively soon. Uh, but uh, we're in a different situation than Boise State. Uh, the other aspect of the Boise State furlough plan is people are having to take a significant number of days between now and July 1 to impact this fiscal year. Uh, they had significant losses in revenue uh, uh, by not being able to have concerts and other events at their arena. We certainly had some losses as well, but not to the same extent. Uh, but we're each in different uh, financial situations. We're responding both similarly and differently, but we're not, um, we do not have a current furlough plan in place. How are we planning to modify new student orientation and recruiting events for fall? How can we help and engage with this? Student affairs, I, I'm sorry about my internet connection being unstable here. Can you guys hear me? Um, student affairs does have a plan for modifying um, new student orientation. They've been working on that now uh, for quite a while. As you may know, they had had a, a revised um, orientation plan that was set to go forward, um, but they've had to change that. Um, they do have materials available. Um, on their website, and I can also send that link out um, to the deans when we're done with this meeting as well. A student had, has recently had a computer breakdown. Are there any loaner computers available? If you know of students who are having technological problems or have concerns with access to hardware or, or to um, Wi-Fi, um, please have them contact the ITRC, and the ITRC has been handling those one-on-one um, -on -one, um, cases um, from the beginning of this crisis, and including um, providing you know, headsets and, um, action, and cameras as well. So these are um, issues that the ITRC can address as well as IT. Next question, are we considering a blended approach such as an in-person for the first eight and online for the last eight and or offering each traditional delivery class as both online and in-person so that students can choose or rotate in and out which delivery they want and can be ready to move online if as necessary? I think all of the options um, listed there are, are things that our team is, is taking into consideration as they're trying to figure out what is the best way to get, um, A, get everyone back to work, and B, um, the, get the classes in the fall. As I said now, we're planning on face-to-face, -face, but we will have contingency plans uh, based on what we're hearing from that group and based on what the health advice is going to be. We expect to get a little bit more clarity on that in the next couple of weeks, um, depending on um, how you know Idaho's own curve is going and what the guidance that comes from the state board and the governor's office. Uh, but given that, we I do anticipate that, especially with large sections, that we will probably have some contingency plans in the mix for those, as well as uh, this idea of blended. Um, that is something that we would have to tell students up front. Like that first eight week session um, can be online, and they just have to understand um, that the second week. Uh, is second eight weeks is face to face or you know remote students who have no intention of taking the class on campus would have to understand that that transition was going to happen so those kinds of things would have to be managed but i do anticipate those types of contingency plans in the mix um, as we go forward here uh, certainly for that the latter sections of summer um, but uh, maybe even into the fall how will leadership balance short-term cu short cuts while still investing in faculty's long-term success? I fear that short-term budget solutions will mean that faculty are unsupported and longer-term budget implications will be even more devastating. Well, it's hard to know what those kinds of short-term um, 
types of cuts are causing the concern. Um, certainly the goal of the provost's office is to manage the cuts campus-wide, to minimize impacts to programs and to the, our ability to, de to deliver those programs and to support faculty in doing that. And so that is the overall goal. Um, we certainly don't want to institute short-term cuts that cost more in the long term and then they benefit us in the short term. So that's one of the things that we um, are certainly going to look at in terms of uh, when these um, proposals get to that stage of evaluation. <clears throat> I think Candy and Mark might want to jump in here on you know, more local um, types of questions though that might be occurring in, in your colleges. Or not. <laughs> Mark, do you want to go? Yeah, from my perspective, you know, we are going to try and do our best to support our faculty and their success. Uh, one of the things that we did talk about in my college was cutting some travel, which I know is a concern for all faculty, but we're going to try and develop a process in which we can best support those faculty who most need some of those travel, travel funds. So um, we're certainly aware of that, cognizant, and working on that to plan. Our intent is not to leave anybody out hanging. Um, as I said, our, our focus is meeting the needs of our students, our programs, and our faculty as we move forward. So I don't think it's any different for any, anybody else's plan that I've seen so far. No, and, and any kind of temporary cuts, at least um, that were proposed by Cal, really have more to do with the limitations that we expect to have in the coming year. So, you know, given the situation, we probably won't do as much hiring. So relocation costs might be something short term that we can give up a little of. So along those lines, um, in, in an effort to, again, try to be able to recover as quickly as we can from this um, without having a long-term Im long impact. Okay, and there are a few questions about uh, commencement and if there's a plan for a virtual commencement. Well, I, I know that um, we have a team of people, and Ginny actually might be able to um, answer part of that, that working on commencement planning and also on how to celebrate our students in this virtual environment. Uh, there is a link um, to a list of, or, or there will be, um, I know that that's in process, a list of events um, for spring, uh, some of those at the college level, virtual events at the college level, I should say. and. Um, Certainly, and looking also at you know how do we manage commencement going forward? Uh, this group is is coming forward with some recommendations for um, commencements that would that would occur perhaps in the summer um, and or and Jenny shared the, a link with us um, that we'll have more information in the coming days and and also a an expanded commencement uh, that would occur probably at the end of the fall term. Anything you want to add to that or correct, Jenny? Nope, that's right. Um, we we did send out um, communication with all graduates, upcoming graduates, um, inviting them to come back in December or next spring to the physical location. Um, and then all of the individual colleges are planning a variety of celebratory, virtual, and otherwise um, events. And that is in the process of final approval now and should be forthcoming. And isu.edu slash commencement um, will have that detail uh, when it's available. Okay. What's my place here? One second. Okay. Will there be a higher number of students required with summer classes? If so, has an approximately has an approximate size range been decided? Um, no. And in fact, we don't have a size range anyway. Uh, for summer. Now some of the colleges do, but the provost office has not instituted any kind of size range for any um, sections campus-wide. Uh, we do anticipate leaving, as I said before, um, courses on the schedule with fewer students than, than would normally be the case um, because we just are, are waiting to understand our enrollment trend and that applies to summer as well. And so there isn't a limit on the number of students that we need in those sections and we will plan on evaluating those as we go forward, but we anticipate leaving sections with fewer students on the schedule. Okay. 
Many courses on campus have necessary physical contact, uh, for example, health science courses. What plans are in place for providing students and faculty PPE? Um, that is, uh, it's too bad that Rex is not here because he's been managing that process. We have created, and Glenn may be able to contribute to this, we have created a list of our supplies campus-wide. Um, if we don't utilize those, those are going to be either refunded back to the departments or, or shared with the departments. Uh, we, we certainly will make sure the departments have what they need in terms of of PPE uh, going forward. I, I understand that some of them have given it up and we're gonna need it, we're gonna need it back. Um, Ginny, you said that there are a number of questions still remaining. I know that some of us have other obligations and now how many are there? Um, we have about 10 left. Well, we can stay for a few more minutes, I think, and um, try to answer some of those. And then I know that we're going to start to lose people because of other obligations. So if you need to go, that's fine. And we'll just stay for a few more minutes to answer a few more questions. Great. Next up, with the well-documented biases inherent in student evaluations of teaching under even the best of circumstances, how can we justify using them now under the worst of circumstances? This is particularly of concern for faculty likely to have additional care responsibilities which likely for a host of reasons fall heavier on women and younger faculty. Well, as um, I, we've talked about a little bit here, the student evaluations from this term are going to be evaluated very differently than we normally evaluate a student evaluations. Um, in many cases, they just won't be utilized. Um, certainly in a five year time frame, for example, we don't anticipate needing uh, to use them at all. Um, if they're a significant outlier, um, I think that they have to be dis discarded as a result of what's going on here. Um, in some cases, they won't be. I mean, we have, we have faculty so who have been teaching online all semester who who certainly don't want us to throw out their teaching evaluations from this term because they were online from day one. And so it, there isn't a, a um, one size fits all answer to this. Uh, it will have to be managed by chairs and deans and the provost office. But um, some of our faculty are gonna have great evaluations that they don't want thrown out the window. So uh, we will evaluate that going forward. But certainly the, the concerns from this semester will mean that we manage these evaluations it's different. Okay. Next question. How will international faculty be affected by budget cuts? How will university and college level leadership ensure that their positions are unfairly targeted by cuts? That is a great question in terms of how we handle those, those international appointments. There certainly is um, a commitment by the institution um, to, to ensure that those faculty are not um, in any way um, discriminated against in, in any other capacity, even in, in addition to the one asked about here, um, we are committed to our international faculty. We also will work with them in terms, I know the International Programs Office um, it has been creating mechanisms um, to manage some of the concerns around travel. Um, and travel back home, and uh, the concerns that some of our international faculty are going to experience in their home countries if they are coming from here. Um, we have the highest rate of infection um, in the world, and as a result, um, we're gonna experience some challenges going anywhere um, from the US, and as a result, our international faculty are, are struggling with that in terms of, of managing that on going back to their home countries. So International Programs Office has some resources to, to assist with that, and, and we are in a complex environment in relationship to our own um, travel in general in the fact that there are gonna be some international conferences that are, are not going to want American um, participation in if we're, if we're coming directly from here. So those are things that we're gonna to have to uh, work on as we go forward. How long is the travel ban as of today? Um, is that, it's indefinite. Um, Glenn, do you have any um, additional answer to that? No, it's just we're still, the emergency operations uh, team is still meeting two or three times a week and uh, continually monitoring 
uh, the situation based on input from from the health department, uh, from Dr. Force and and Dr. Solbrig. So it's I'd like to lift it as soon as possible, but I don't know when that will be. Are there any plans to try to increase fundraising efforts? As an example, could we ask our alumni who can donate, who can to donate 10% or 20% of their stimulus checks? Well, certainly fundraising has been ongoing throughout this crisis. As some of you may know that we have a new vice president um, for advancements and, and Kyle um, maybe will be able to join us at a future um, town hall, um, Kyle McGowan, who has been restructuring our advancement efforts campus-wide, um, working very closely with our alumni during this time period. We do have alums who have reached out and donated all kinds of things um, to help the institution during this time period. They've been amazing. Um, everything from, you know, food for Benny's Pantry to uh, special support for academic programs. And so that, that connection um, has, it has been in many ways strengthened during this time frame. And, and Kyle will, I'm sure, be happy to give us an update at a future town hall. And, and we will be having future town halls after we get through the budget process and have a better sense of what our back to work plan looks like. And I'll just add to that. I mean, Cal feels very, um, feels very much appreciated by the community with some of our performances having to be discontinued. Um, we've had some really generous donations um, in support of the performing arts. So um, Laura is absolutely right. We continue to do the kind of outreach um, and fundraising that's appropriate in these times. Um, and, and we've been very blessed. Okay. Looks like we have three questions left. Um, just branching off of what was previously spoke, spoken about in regards to a compromised job market and opportunities available to reach out to those groups looking to retrain, would it be possible to work in collaboration with the unemployment office to provide targeted attention? Possible anyone on un unemployment insurance a discounted, um, possibly offering anyone on unemployment insurance a discounted tuition or credit discount? Um, I know that our um, career center has been working with the labor department on targeting opportunities for for the the large number of people who have been in contact with the labor department and who have been displaced by this crisis. So uh, student affairs is working hard on that in terms of are there ways to discount? Um, certainly going forward, we know that we're that we do have um, additional, opportunities um, for, for um, support and for unemployed um, individuals, but also for our own students uh, through the CARES Act. And uh, the parameters of that are, are sort of still in process. Um, Glenn may have additional updates, but we, we anticipate that there will be new opportunities for, for people to come back to school and different ways of supporting that. Graduate students across the university are being differentially affected by the stay-at-home order in terms of their ability to continue their research and make progress on degree completion. Will this be taken into account somehow when looking at program health viability and graduation rates so as not to adversely affect programs? Well, we know that graduate students have been uh, disproportionately impacted in terms of how they complete their research projects in particular. A lot of concern about that in the departments and in the colleges. Our graduate school is focusing on ways to support that um, effort and also and will be an advocate uh, for programs going forward. We do not want to penalize programs for what happens in this time period. We know we are going to have um, reduced um, graduates in in the short term. We're trying to work with programs to make sure that we can minimize that by extending the terms. We haven't talked very much about that in, in here, but the other forums have had questions about those extended terms, and I've sent out additional information about that um, just in the last day to the deans. We do have term extensions for spring that will allow you to extend um, hands-on courses for example, with still a spring graduation date, and that may help in some of these cases. In others, um, going forward, we, we will have to make sure uh, that in the data produced for program viability and health, that um, we note that 
the impact of, of COVID on those graduation rates. I just referred a student to the counseling center, but I'm wondering if they're overloaded right now. How quickly can a student get an appointment with a therapist at this point and can services continue into the summer for them if they are not enrolled in summer classes? I'm worried that they can't, can't get help quickly enough and that they would have to find another therapist soon after they started at ISU. I've been working um, very closely with our student affairs um, counseling team. Uh, they are open, they are accepting um, appointments. At this point, I actually think the waiting time has been reduced. Um, they do plan on continuing to serve students through the summer. Um, this is all it, it, largely virtual. Um, there may be exceptions to that, um, but they are working very hard to meet the needs of students. Uh, we can provide um, additional updates from student affairs to the deans if that would be helpful regarding those, those you know, any kind of hours, but student affairs has said, um, please refer students who you are concerned about, either, either to the dean of students or to counseling and testing, and they will reach out directly to them. I received a question a few minutes ago. Uh, <clears throat> doesn't really Im impact faculty, but it does impact our financial situation. Uh, it says, do you know if there has been any substantive savings on power HVAC with so many offices being vacant for the last three or four weeks? Uh, I just received a text in that during this time period, our electricity is 10% down over last year, same time and our gas is 30% down over last year at the same time. How much of that has to do with the weather between the two periods or the fact that um, we are somewhat closed down, I'm not sure, that equates to about $65,000 of, of savings. So you're gonna just transfer that, Glenn, to these two colleges? Actually, we have a... <laughs> We currently have a $9 million deficit for the current fiscal year, so it just made our deficit 65,000 less. Although, if Mark and Candy twist my arm enough, maybe it can come that direction, or Gene. They'll have three people to pile on now. Okay. What accommodations are you considering for faculty who are immunocompromised who may need to teach online in the fall? Well, we're definitely going to have to have. We are, no question about it, going to have to have in, a, in the phasing plan uh, options for vulnerable uh, faculty, but also for um, employees who are simply just not comfortable. They may not fall in to that um, official vulnerable category, and that is still being refined, honestly. Um, but we definitely will um, need to have those accommodations in place. And, and like I said, I don't anticipate that we will be 100% back to normal uh, for quite some time. Um, and the planning for that will have to be uh, flexible and, and um, accommodating. And it, and it will probably drive us all crazy, but we, we definitely need to take into account um, just concerns people have about their own health, but also um, options for students who have the same concerns. And this is our last question, and um, thanks for, to everybody for hanging in with us for these extra questions. Uh, if faculty and staff are let go due to budget cuts, will there be an automatic letter from the university stating this in their personnel file? This could be very beneficial for those going back on the job market. Um, that's kind of an HR question. I don't think we have anybody from HR here, but... Uh, Brian, are you on by any chance? He was at one point, I thought. I think we maybe lost him. Okay. Uh, if you receive a, or at least this is on the staff side, I, I'm not up to date on, on ISU on the faculty side. Uh, for staff employees, if they are a non-classified employee, if they receive a non-renewal letter, there's no reason given in the letter other than they are being non-renewed. Um, and we do that because it's a right to work state. Um, certainly, uh, if their performance was uh, meeting standards or above, I would imagine that their supervisors would be willing to give them a good reference. I don't know about the the wording if you non-renew faculty members, Laura. 
Um, you know, it, it's clearly depends on the circumstances. I mean, if this is a tenure promotion, um, if it's a tenure denial and the, can't, that faculty member is in uh, at the end of their tenure period, then of course the reason would be that they didn't meet that, um, they didn't reach the tenure, tenure standard, standard. So it, it depends on the circumstances. Um, I could envision a situation though where the offer or the um, recommendation letters, uh, you know, the support for that person would say um, this was due to the extreme circumstances of the campus um, and, and um, you know, those recommendation letters could say not to that, that person's um, performance. That's all the questions we have today. I have a few more budget recommendations or ideas that I'll send to you and Glenn offline. Great. Thanks, Jenny. That's a great job uh, moderating. That was a lot to moderate. Um, really appreciate everybody staying here. Uh, almost everybody stayed on with us into uh, in, beyond the time and uh, appreciate all of the questions and your engagement. Uh, it's great to see you all. I, I'm sorry that it's in, under these circumstances. I'm sorry that we're not in a room all together, um, but it's still really great to see you all and have the opportunity to talk through some of these things. We didn't quite get to, um, I, I know that there could po possibly be more questions. We will have additional town halls in the next probably month, or, about a month, I would say, month and a half, once we get through the budget process and we can report on that. And um, we know uh, the outcomes of the state guidance for back to work plans. But in the meantime, please feel free to reach out to my office. Um, we are um, available to answer questions or concerns or to the deans. I know the deans have been already fielding a whole bunch of questions, um, mm -hmm. but Candy and Mark um, are available to answer those questions as well. And uh, we will stay in touch. I appreciate your time. Thank you, everybody. Be well. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe. <laughs>